Welcome to the HR Dialogues. I'm your host, Dr. Dieter Feltzman. Today, we've got an exciting episode lined up where we will be talking about talent management and how you can apply some new talent experience principles in your own organization. Welcome to the HR Dialogues, where we learn from people practitioners as they navigate the emerging world of work. Marna, welcome to the HR Dialogues. Marna, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Why are you passionate about talent management? My name is Marna. I work at AHR as a subject matter expert. I started my career in HR generalist role and I then pursued a career as an organizational psychologist um, and then crafted my career into talent management. I ended up in talent management by chance um, and more around understanding why people behave the way they do, how organizations tap into that um, yeah, and I've been doing that for the past 12 years, um, currently completing my PhD on the topic. Let's dive right in and Marna. Talent management is such an important domain. And I think as we shift and move forward into the new world of work with some of the new challenges around AI and skills and skills-based organizations, I think talent is going to be a very important one. To get us started, let's go back to basics. When I say talent management, what does that refer to? What's a simple way to understand the practice? I think there's so many definitions, which is part of part of what makes talent management difficult in practice. simple way to describe it is the, the processes and the practices, so the things we do to ensure that we have an adequate demand and supply of talent in the organization. So I think important to link it back to strategy. So it's a strategic endeavor. It's not things that we just do. Um, and the ultimate outcome of it is to make sure that we have access and availability of, of the skills that we need. Something I do want to touch on a bit though and something I've seen in practice is people struggle with where does talent management sit if talent management sits there what are the activities that need to fit there and I think that also contributes towards this lack of a definition of what a talent function looks like or a talent practice share a little bit of your experience there definitely I think we used to joke about it and say it's a talent management blanket so mm. in, in some organizations it's it's everything but it's also then nothing um, so I think when it is that broad and we don't define where it starts and where it ends and really guided by what we want to get out of it you end up with it being everything and nothing um, and I think that then also speaks to where it sits in the organization. So functions should follow form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so where, where we put it um, impacts who makes decisions, what airtime does it get, in which forums does it show up, how do we make decisions. So I think it being too broad and not being clearly defined definitely doesn't do us any favors, um, which then trickles into where it sits in the organization as well. I've seen it work well where it sits with, to your point, strategic decision-making ability. So usually typically close to a head of HR or a CHRO from a reporting line and authority point of view. I think it depends on the organization is sometimes clustered with other functions. I've seen talent and learning. I've seen talent and performance. I've seen talent on its own. I've seen talent to include talent acquisition. I've seen talent to exclude talent acquisition. So I think it is really important that whenever we talk about talent management, that we have a clear definition. We are very clear around what is going to solve the problem that we are trying to focus on and which functions either need to pull into, call it your, your talent blanket. Because um, if it's not defined well, I think it leads towards implementation challenges. Marna, that brings us to the question of what are some of the misconceptions? And you can also rephrase that question to say, what are some of the myths that people hold about talent management? I think I think you've already touched on one, that it's just we relabel the entire life cycle and everything mm -hmm. is talent management. I think that's that's one that, that I personally struggle with is we don't clearly define it. And I think that on the opposite end, it's that it is succession planning. So sometimes I've been in organizations where that's all that we speak about. When we speak talent management, we talk succession planning. And, and that's really difficult um, in terms of where we focus and what we include and, and what airtime we give it. So I think those also um, misconceptions. I think another one that's I've also found in my experience is that people think that it's easy. So we used to joke and say everyone in the room is a talent management expert. So when we talk about things like org design, people kind of trust mm. the org design specialist to do what they need to do. In talent management, we often find that everyone is an expert and everyone has an opinion mm. on talent management. So I think it comes from that it's easy, anyone can do it. Um, misconception as well. On that last one though, I think we've also slipped up a bit by not necessarily driving the practice from either a data point of view or from a very scientific perspective. And I've, in the past, I've kind of been held to believe that sometimes we allow business to dictate the rhythm and the tone of how the practice plays out. Your views and thoughts on that? Definitely. And I think uh, interesting and in, in, in from an academic perspective, my research also showed that, that it's very ill-defined theoretically. So we don't spend a lot of time on defining where it starts, where it ends, what should be included, what's the theoretical foundation of it. So then we leave business to, to dictate. 
other interesting observation is that it's often also the practitioner's perspective. Mm. So people hold a very strong belief about what talent management is. They bring that to the organization and that's the way things are done. Um, so I think I completely agree. We don't do ourselves any favors um, if we don't define it properly and we don't take business along. Mm. Um, if you don't own the space, then it's open for anyone to, to take, take ownership. Mm. I also think it's a it's a practice that matures over time, right? I think it's something about helping and educating the business over time around what talent management will really deliver. I've personally made the mistake to go and sell a talent practice with all the great strategic outputs that you will only get a couple of years down the line because talent, it is a long-term endeavor. It's not an immediate solve, especially when you start getting towards more strategic and complex problems that you're trying to solve as part of that. So I've also seen people implement a very fragmented practice where this thing doesn't talk to that thing and then leaders sit around a table and say, but mm, in the succession planning exercise, we spoke about this and now you're asking budget for something else. Those two things don't don't quite align. So I think that that's probably important. The activity-basedness of talent management also something that, that doesn't do us any favors. Um, and then you would sit in a boardroom and no one is connecting the dots between all of the things that we keep ourselves busy with. So you don't get budget for certain things or certain things don't get prioritized because we're not painting the bigger picture of where, where it fits in. So there's a couple of things that, that hold us back. Um, mm -hmm. I think the one is this narrative around the war for talent, which recently, I think last week, also saw an article which still references the war for talent. And I don't think that's a good concept. Um, I don't think that's a good narrative to drive. I think as with anything else, no one wins a war. Mm -hmm. um, there are no winners. So I think the same is true for, for talent management as well. It's not a sustainable way to manage talent from mm -hmm. organizational perspective, but also for individuals, so I think that's probably probably the biggest one. The other one that I think is also, that I've seen is you, we try and search for a model that's potentially a maturity model and we take it and we blindly apply it without mm. adapting it or applying our own context to it. Um, and then it fails because it's not fit for purpose. The book and article came out in the 90s and I think what was also happening at the time, and it builds on your second point, is that in the context of when it was written, it was very different than what today looks like, where we are a lot more about skills-based economies, mobility in the talent space. Um, it's not about securing people and then locking them in for an extended period of time. When we use the word talent, it means a million different things for different people. So I've had various debates with HR practitioners about why not everybody is talent or why everybody should be talent. And to be very honest, I've had people very angry at me and very offended when I've said, you know, that's not a talent pool that we are looking at. It doesn't diminish the individual, but that's not the way that we think about talent in this context. Any of your experiences there, was I wrong? Were I supposed to just kind of fall in line and say, that's fine, everyone is talent, or is there a different way? What we call talent and what we refer to really has an impact on, on what we do, but then also the experience of those individuals who are or are not considered to be talent. So I think you know, it could include everyone, um, depending on what we're trying to get right. It could also be very exclusive to a few people. I think more importantly is how you translate that for people and how you make that real and how you also do that consistently. So it shouldn't be someone's opinion or my understanding of something. It should be based on what are we trying to achieve. If those are the outcomes that we're driving, we have to be selective or we can include everyone because that's the type of culture that we want or or development goals that we have, as an example. And the culture piece is really important for me there because I think, you know, the context where, where I kind of ran into trouble was a very family type of organization. So if you think competing values framework, almost like that clan culture, where it's all about relationships and bringing everyone together. And me then coming with a concept that says, it's about high performing talent who are, you know, the 20% that does 80% of the work. That was kind of, I really ran into a bit of a brick wall there. So. I think a good lesson to take away from that is that context matters to your earlier point. Um, you have to look at also around the definitions need to be helpful in terms of how we move the practice forward. Um, and we often talk about the talent philosophy, right? Are you inclusive? Are you exclusive? Are you looking at things in a different way and to have clarity just around what that means? Because the talent practice is not supposed to exclude. The talent practice is supposed to make sure that we've got adequate focus that will look different for different groups in the organization. Talent management is a business outcome focused activity so we do it for the good of the business doesn't mean that we have to exclude people which is why I'm a bit of an advocate for bringing career management closer to the talent management space because that's how you ensure that you still manage people's careers whether or not they're identified as whatever you define as talent mm. um, but you still allow people to manage their careers within the ecosystem of, of talent management so there is this 
conception that talent management is largely the bigger organizational construct and it comes from an organizational point of view and you know to be honest it's executives sitting around a table deciding who goes on training and who not who's going to be the successor whereas i think real robust talent management does include things that a lot of people view as other practices which in my view is actually under the same blanket or umbrella um I think the experience domain has moved a lot closer towards talent. I think there's definitely overlap with the career domain that you've spoken about. Um, I think we're also starting to see a lot more there around L&D, not only as an execution mechanism of career paths, but also as a bit of an employee engagement strategy um, that forms part of that. Marna, we've spoken about why it doesn't work. Let's talk about where it does work. What does it provide to the business? And can we talk about some examples there around how do I know my talent strategy is working? If you ask me, it's when people talk about the great career experience that they have. We know that we're doing talent management right on the one end. The other is if we have a sustainable supply of talent. Um, so we have access to the skills that we need, but we also have availability of that that we've created through development or through very directed efforts. Where I've seen it go well is where there's been an adaptive approach. So we had an overarching framework as an example. So everyone has the same philosophy. We talk about talent management in the same way, mm -hmm. but it's applied very differently and used to prioritize different activities once the different businesses then starts implementing. So for example, in a sales environment, your talent management execution and activities will look very different to your investment business. So I think that works well where you have a common understanding in the business um, about what talent management is, but still adaptive enough that it can take context into account. Um, so I think that's that's one example of where I've seen it work work really well. So I think, Mana, we've spoken about and something that's interesting that you've mentioned is it has to be underpinned by shared understanding and principles, right, for talent to really work. Um, I think something that I've also seen in the environment and you've, you've mentioned it is where We've been on this big drive around standardization of talent practices and pushing through things in a consistent way that does not work for all businesses because very often, you know, a call center environment is different than a sales environment is very different than a IT environment. Um, I love the fact that you talk about adaptive talent management because I do think that that's where the world is heading. Also, I think it's shifted the in the objective of good talent management. And you've mentioned, you know, it's about the availability of skill at the right time in order to execute on what the business needs to do. Whereas in the past, I do think it was a little bit about finding the people, keeping the people and motivating the people, which I think is a very limiting view um, with regards to that. How do you see the practice changing at the moment? Um, you and I have often talked about the fact that, you know, maybe somebody doesn't stay that long. Maybe that is OK. Uh, but how have you seen that evolve? Yeah, I think the biggest changes have been in the, the talent acquisition space. Um, I think talent management has been lagging a little bit behind in kind of the broader how do we retain and what do we do with people once they're in the environment. But I think um, the adoption of technology, definitely. So we see it in internal mobility practices that we see the internal marketplace, which is a concept I love, um, which is applying talent acquisition principles to talent that's already in the organization. Um, a lot more focus on how do I redeploy skills? How do I follow more of a skills-based approach to talent management, um, which is an approach I like because it does take the individual talent out mm. of it and, and talks about skills and people can be applied in different contexts as well. So I think those are the biggest, biggest shifts. Um, there's some, I think the experience movement or focus on experience has brought it closer to the career management space where we at least acknowledge that there's an individual whose career is impacted by the decisions that we make and mm. our talent management practices. So I've seen a lot of organizations do that, which is quite encouraging where we don't separate the experience from mm. um, what we do in the talent management activity necessarily. To build on that, how do you have the conversation in with the business where the perception is still very much talent management is what we do and you know career development and career experience, don't worry, that's an individual responsibility. It's a little bit of the, the mentality to say build it and they will come. You know, we will have a learning platform, we will have opportunities, people can grow their careers. But I think we require a little bit more in that space to make it a reality. The easiest way to do it is potentially to align career management with your talent management practice. I think the last thing you want to do, and at least in my experience, is go and pitch career management as another practice that HR now yeah, forces agree. the business to do. So I think in thinking about careers and being intentional in how you craft your talent management practice so that it enables a particular experience already is half the battle won. And then I think to reflect it in, in kind of the metrics or the things that we look at. So when we report on talent management to ensure that we also talk about Internal mobility, as an example, mm. how many internal candidates did we appoint versus external, as an example. Succession plans that come to fruition, so where we actually have appointed a successor and they didn't move out. Um, so I think those kind of things. So I would 
get buy-in by incorporating it from a practice perspective because that's where our expertise lies. It's mm. not it's not the business's responsibility to buy into certain things. It's I think we have to craft it in a way that it's appealing to business and they see the business outcome mm. um, of it. So in my experience, that's what that's what I would do. And the buy-in is unfortunately really important. So you have to create a culture where we all believe in the same things. Um, and talent management is important. It is important on the agenda. We all try and make it work. We don't hold on to people. <laughs> we let people go. We loosen the shackles at some point. Um, yeah, so I do think it, it's important. I don't, don't think I would pitch career management as an additional practice that they need to buy into, but I would be smart in thinking about the talent experience um, mm. as part of the broader talent management practice. A couple of things that you've mentioned I think really hits home for me. And the first one, and you're going to smile at me when I'm saying this, is the concept of talent hoarding. Um, which is, and I've been in various boardrooms where leaders are so protective about the talent that they've developed that they actually don't nominate them for succession opportunities. They might have three, four people ready for movements in their own division, but they don't put up their hand and says, you know what, I think there's something else for you in the broader organization. So that is limiting, I think, to any, any talent practice. Second thing that you mentioned, which I really like, is the fact that we have to make the outcomes of talent management very simple. Um, in the fact that what is it difference that it's making to business and what problem is it trying to solve versus us getting extremely caught up on what fits where and what, what contributes to what type of activity that we are trying to do. You know, I found in my experience, business don't really care where talent sits and who does what they want to answer the question around, do I have the people to execute? If I don't, what are we doing about it? Um, and the last thing that you've mentioned, which just triggered a thought on my side, is I sometimes think HR, we are a little bit too overeager in the talent management practice. Let me give some context there. You know, if somebody leaves in the organization, it's not HR's fault, right? I think, and the point I'm trying to make there is that business takes a very big chunk of the ownership around a successful talent practice. And it's been helpful to me to almost see yourself more as a facilitator of the process, making sure that there's visibility about talent, making sure that the rhythms of talent and the habits of good talent management is in place but it's not about taking over the ownership and the accountability from a business side of things because that's a losing battle. If you think about someone's career experience, so much of it is shaped with their direct line manager or the interactions mm -hmm. with leadership. So they do play a big part. And I think things like visibility of skills, it's also unfair to ask a line manager to take accountability for succession planning, but we don't equip them. So mm -hmm. I think putting the, the things in place that enable line managers to take ownership because it does, it does also rest of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think once you get your hands dirty, then you also start believing in, in the things that you are busy with. Yeah, you've got skin in the game. If you disempower me to be able to do the job that I need to as a leader or a manager, and I think talent is such a good example there, then I almost can't be held accountable for the consequences when things go wrong and right on both those instances. And I think that's something just to consider around where you know, the key responsibilities lie. Man, I want to move us along a bit to the conversation because I think a significant movement in talent and for the good and for the better of all of us has been the incorporation of a lot more evidence-based practice and data-driven talent practices. You know, when I think about talent reviews, a lot of people cringe immediately and they think about these rooms where you sit and then I say, hmm, you know, person X, I don't like them. I don't think they'll be a good fit based on what type of information. How have you seen data come into the talent practice and what role does it play in driving an adequate and fit for purpose practice? So I'm a super advocate for, for data-driven practice. Talent management cannot be done without data. And I would go as far as to say without technology. So no one wants the spreadsheet or the PowerPoint that has, has all of the, the data because it lives at a point in time. So every time we do the exercise, we start from scratch. So I think data and technology are really important enablers of, of the practice. And that's also because we generate a lot of data through the practice. So mm. if you think of every interaction under the talent management umbrella or the blanket or whatever we want to call it, it generates a lot of data and we have to be able to track that data to make informed decisions, which is then the other part is that decision making has to be based on, on data. So when we define something like potential, we have to be able to say potential for what and how do we measure it. So it's not just someone's opinion, opinion can be part of it, but it has to be informed by, by data. So big advocate for for driving a data-driven talent management practice, um, preferably on, on some sort of technology. I think there's also, you know, and all of us have been in those exercises, right? When I hear the word talent survey, I sometimes, you know, have cold sweat that kind of just starts because it's going to be six weeks of chasing people to give information and collating and you don't have a place where it kind of continuously lives. And by the time you've got it, it's outdated again. So 
I think we have to think very differently. And I, I know you're a fan of the concept of building a talent profile continuously and allowing people to engage and interact almost in a social manner with their own talent profile. So it's one of the sneaky ways that you connect career management to talent management is you allow people to own their own data. So you want to know what skills people have, what are they learning. Sometimes we don't even know that people have completed certain mm. development opportunities and, and that their skills have evolved. So, But to let people own that, to also allow them to raise their hand for particular opportunities, um, to interact with their own talent profile, which also then for us saves the time of surveying at a point in time again. We have real time data, but it has to become part of how what the business mm. how the business operates. I think when people see that they complete their profiles but nothing ever happens, they also stop doing it. Mm. Um, so I think it's in the in the use of it and creating a culture where that's the way that we do things. Um, mm. And the line manager should be comfortable to access that data when they have a conversation or they have to make certain decisions as well. So it does also point down towards the fact that Talent management is sometimes positioned as this dark art that nobody talks about. And one day when I become a leader, I'm now part of the clan, you know, that talks about talent management. We have to create broader understanding of the practicalities and where we find certain things and a lot more transparency. And with that, I'm not sharing, saying share, you know, your mapping of what talent looks like, but the transparency, at least so that people know what their data is being used for and the importance of how that actually enables them to build a career within the organization in the context of solving the broader talent management uh, you know, challenges. You mentioned something which I love is around visibility, because very often, and especially when I speak to people analytics practitioners as well, and I ask them this very simple question, you know, how do you know what skills you have in the organization? You know, we've just kickstarted in a project for two, three years to try and find out what skills do we have? How do we define skills? What skills do we need? And I think a continuous talent collection approach and kind of updating that approach does help a lot, um, you know, in terms of being able to make point in time decisions without having to go through a huge collection, you know, exercise uh, really as part of that. And by the time you're done with the data, it's outdated data. Spot on, right? I'm going to ask you a very pointed question on that one because I think a lot of people say, yeah, we know talent data is important. When we talk about talent data, give us a couple of examples. What does talent data actually look like? What are the types of things that I need to make informed decisions? Yeah, so I think it, it speaks to someone's experience. So how long have they been in the business in their particular roles? So things like tenure, type of qualification, um, now more than ever the skills component. So what is it that I can do? And if we can va validate or verify that in mm -hmm. some way, so someone endorses my skill or I have something that backs up, um, so I think skill level data are becoming much more important. Um, and then I think an important one is also the, the career aspirations bit. So asking people, what is it that you want to do? Where do you see your career going? Um, where have you been that mm. we maybe don't know about? Because I think sometimes when people are very tenured in the organization, uh, their CVs are lost some way. So also mm. keeping it similar to like a LinkedIn profile um, so that we have a good understanding of where someone has been, what they're able to do, but also where do they want to go and go and apply themselves in, in the business so that we can make mm -hmm. decisions about that. I've also seen where we sometimes we hire somebody into a job with a very designated job description and that becomes the full identity of the person. People forget that people had a past where they applied other skills. Um, maybe anecdotally, but I was doing work for an advertising agency and in the morning that they were shooting a very big commercial, they um, hired a, a saxophone player for the day. And the saxophone player phoned in sick and said, I'm really, really sorry. And they had the entire shoot booked out for the day, big crisis, a lot of tears. And then all of a sudden, you know, one of the younger employees you know, kind of raised his hand and he said, you know, I play in a jazz band and I actually play saxophone. Stupid example. But what I, the point I want to make is around, do we really know what people can do and what they've done and what they can apply, especially in today's world of transferable skills? And I think if we start creating a lot more visibility there, I think it makes just the opportunities of where talent supply is going to come from, I think much more robust. You spoke earlier about a talent marketplace and the audience will not forgive me if I do not dive into that one a little bit more because it is such a hot and a relevant topic that a lot of organizations are grappling with on the one side or experimenting with um, on the other side as well. I'm not always a fan of a technology first approach, but in this case, the technology is really great that's out there. Essentially, it's a platform where as an organization, I go with my opportunities and I put that out and um, whether that's an actual vacancy or short term assignment or project or whatever that format is. 
for the individual, it allows them to go through the marketplace and to offer their, their skills, to raise their hand and to apply for certain opportunities. So it's essentially this give and take um, mm -hmm. that we facilitate through a platform. Um, what's really great about it and what it does is it allows line managers to have visibility of it. So a line manager can go in and search for certain skills if they have a project and they need um, a specific type of technical skill, they can go and look at who has that in the business, reach out to them. They can also see who's had their hand raised for a particular opportunity, so we align people with the type of opportunities that they are after. And then of course, as an individual, I'm able to go somewhere and I have visibility of all of the opportunities that are available and not just things that I by chance see mm -hmm. um, or, or someone tells me about. So a really great transparent way for skills trading essentially. Mm -hmm. um, for, for internal talent. There has been some really good success stories about fast tracking development, keeping people a lot more engaged, as well as, and you know, this is something I've never been able to understand in the workforce planning environment. Some organizations go through cycles where certain parts of the business will be extremely busy and other parts is a little bit okay, but they don't organize their capacity according to the skill that they have in a similar vein. So I've been a big fan of, you know, trying to move people through the organization where the need is at that point in time, obviously aligned to their own ambitions um, as well. And I think a marketplace just helps. It just makes it a little bit more formalized and structured and it's not the biased approach. And the, the other benefit that you also get is that if you want to build a particular capability in the organization, you are able to do so proactively. So you can intentionally set up development opportunities for people to build that capability. So it's also more proactive um, in how we think about how we use skills and deploy skills in the business. Marna, let's talk a little bit about the controversial stuff that nobody talks about whenever we talk about talent management, right? And the first one that does jump to mind is um, I get so many requests and questions from people to say, should I use the nine box grid? Um, should I not use the nine box grid? Should I use the 18 box grid? I've seen one of those. Should I use the matrix, the four box? Let's talk a little bit about the nine box grid. What's your view on it? Um, is it useful? How would you guide someone there? Yeah, so I think full disclosure is I do have a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with the nine box grid. And I think the nine box grid in itself is not good or bad. It's in the application that we've seen it go horrifically wrong and where it gets a very bad reputation. Um, so I think the nine box grid applied incorrectly can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. I do think the reason why people like it is because it simplifies decision making, right? So it helps us to categorize talent. It helps us think about data in a very structured way so that we can decide what do we now do next. So I think if we can latch onto the benefit of the nine box grid and what's what's made it so popular. I think we can apply it in different contexts. I do think it is time for a bit of an update. Um, I don't think, and, and I mentioned it earlier, we talk about potential and performance, potential for what, um, and performance in what context. So I do think it needs a bit of a different approach. And I think we've seen shifting it more to a skills-based approach where you start thinking about, let's first talk about the talent segments that I have, and then start looking at people um, and the potential and performance that they have, um, that already shifts the conversation to not just blindly start mapping people and categorizing people, but thinking about it in relation to where they would add value and where that adds value to the organizational strategy. Yeah. Um, so I think there's value in it. I think it needs a bit of an update. <laughs> um, and I think where it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Where it's made me uncomfortable in the past is where the person becomes the the box, right? So we, I say, oh, you know, he or she is a five and fives can't do that type of work. So for me, I think there is very much to your point, the application thereof, but I think also not to use it for what wasn't its intended purpose. Um, the nine box grid was a approach or a tool that's utilized to help understand the talent that you have within the organization to inform the right decisions about how we can develop people into you know different careers different opportunities etc so for me the nine box grid has always been around first remember it's almost three d's right the first one it's a discussion tool it's not the outcome i sometimes find practitioners use the nine box grid and then once they've populated it's like oh great Pilot. talent management has now been done for this year it's actually the start of the process it's a discussion tool that we utilize Brings us to the second D, it has to be based on data. We've got so many great data collection mechanisms that you've already mentioned. It has to be informed by data. And I think that's such a, a move away from the past where, let's be honest, you know, I put it down in front of the manager and said, let's talk about your team. This is what how you mapped them, you know, last year or six months ago. And the third D for me is it has to lead towards decisions because if it doesn't lead towards a decision, it's just a very nice to have visual and it doesn't help people really understand you know, how we're going to move that forward. 
want to dive into your skills comment there a bit because I think that's interesting. Um, I've always been under the impression, and incorrectly so, I've learned over time that you know you have one box grid, but the skills approach is different. You will have a couple based on your talent segments, right? So the idea is that you start with segmenting the skills that you need. So what is critical, what is scarce, so you can understand what skills do you need to absolutely focus on, and then from there you'll take your talent segment or your critical skills and start looking at who are the individuals that have those skills and where do they then fit in. So you almost add a different dimension to it or another level to it where you start off with the organizational context before you dive into the people and have the conversation on there as an individual, but rather for this this pool, what does it look like and where do we have people that need need development, where do we have people that are quite ready for movement and what does that then what does that then mean? So to make that practical, you know, I can be let's refer to top talent just as a as a broad term. I can be top talent aligned to skill set A, but I might not be talent aligned to skill set B because it's a lot more about what I can do and not so much about who I am. I think it becomes a little bit more complex when we start talking about things like general leadership or management, but I still think that there's a good application there around trying to figure out what is the best way to think differently and to view your talent pool from different lenses because I think that does open up a lot of new opportunities. Um, that brings me to my question. Let's talk about modern talent approaches, right? For people listening today, a lot of people would say, you know, talent, okay, I've recruited. We've spoken about who's up for promotion. We have promoted them. You know, that's kind of the talent cycle, is it not? I think companies are doing things very differently today. And I think there's a couple of really exciting strategies um, on the horizon. Can you share a couple of those with us? What we've seen is kind of the getting rid of the, the barriers and the boundaries of, of the organization in talent management. So for the first time, we're starting to think of talent pools outside of just what I own in the organization. So we've seen great success stories of talent exchange programs where we provide people with the opportunity to go and learn something else in a different organization that's mm. not a competitor and then rotate back into the organization with a much broader experience and skill set. So I think that for me is quite, quite exciting. Um, we've also seen the alumni talent or returning talent or keeping the door open and knowing that people will move out and come back and their career paths exist outside of just the organization and that's okay um, and then I think we've spoken about this the, the forgotten talent pool so I think we've started to realize that there's benefit in having neurodiverse talent as an example and there's a lot of contributions that that talent pool can make and, and contribute um, as talent um, we've spoken about retired or close to retirement or post retirement talent as well which has a very important knowledge base that we can tap into in the organization so I think for me what's exciting is the boundarylessness of talent management that is that is emerging beyond the technology um, yeah, the, the technology disruptions that we are seeing in talent acquisition space as well um, but I think for me that's exciting is thinking about talent broader than just what is in the organization, what we have access to. A term that I really like that a lot of people are using is boomerang talent, right? Which was also spoken about the fact that it's returning talent. It's not, you know, talent hopping. It's something completely different. But I do also support the idea that you mentioned around the talent exchange program, because very often the right step for you in your career is not with me as an organization, but I still want to kind of leverage you because you've got potential that, you know, one day I want to utilize in the organization. And I think that's a nice way to start thinking about that. You've mentioned a couple of disruptions and talent acquisition, I think, has seen major disruptions, you know, over the past couple of years. I think there's a lot of clever new approaches, a lot more personalized, um, borrowing, I think, from a lot of other disciplines there as well, which I think is a good thing. Um, and you've often spoken about talent relationship management in the acquisition space. What is, what is that? How does that work? Talent relationship management applies customer relationship management. So delivering what we do in a very personalized way, way, but at scale. So it allows people to opt in for certain opportunities. They decide on the type of communication, the frequency of communication, how they want to interact with talent management. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from the talent relationship management and apply that in the broader talent management space as well, um, which is exciting. It helps us think about technology in a different way. Um, with so many, I think the downside of having so many te technology disruptions is that we often don't know what we should implement and how we should implement it. Mm. Um, so I think it, it helps with those conversations because it really is about the person and the individual and the experience that we are creating in the process. And I think it's also then around how do you you know, translate a lot of these newer disruptions into something tangible and practical that builds. And it's not like we're restarting something every single time. Um, 
to use a very practical example that that you know somebody shared with me before in the talent relationship management space, it's you build a, a funnel for new talent talent to go through based on preferences. We communicate different things, etc. And I think that's immediately a very different experience of the organization even before I've joined. And I think that sets talent up for a very very different um, opportunity within the organization. And I think it is not that difficult to do given the tools that we've got available today because. Acquisition used to be all about volume and scale and efficiency, and I think that's changing a lot more to be about personalization, the right focus, the right segments, building of the brand, the passive talent pools um, that we want to try and attract. And I think that's exciting if you're in HR. It opens up a whole new domain and skill set uh, of things we do need to focus on. It's also that participation. So instead of it happening to me, I participate in a, in a process which also gives you a very different outcome. So I think that's the shift from being very reactive but rather being active and having people participate in the pro process as well and not being almost said victims with subjects of of a particular project. Yeah, I agree and I, and I hear what you're saying there is also around the fact that I think it is shifting from reactive to proactive but also shifting the role players and how we run those certain processes and how we utilize technology to enable that. Um, Man, I can't believe we're already moving towards the end of, of our conversation and I, I want to ask you a last question before I start wrapping up. What advice do you have for HR professionals sitting today listening to this podcast and saying, you know, I hear what she's saying. I'd love to get there, but w w where do I start? My organization, you know, is not there yet. Mm. So I would always say start with your business strategy. I think as with anything else in business, it's what do we want to get right? Because for talent management in particular, it guides what we focus on. So yes, there will be a lot of activities, but really start with what do we want to deliver for the business? Um, what does that look like? So what are then the skills that I need in a very simple way? It doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, and then what do we do to get us there? And some things will be fit for purpose. Um, some things might not. You might chuck out some things that other people are doing. And it's also okay to do that. Um, and I think to meet the business where it's at. Um, and I think another component around data is also to set that up from the start. I think if you truly want embedded data-driven practice, it's better to start setting it up in that way instead of retrospectively trying to find ways to now find data and surveys and all of those lovely things. So, yes, yeah, so I think start with make it a strategic imperative or a strategic process um, and then think about it practically, what do we need to do to get there so that we prioritize accordingly. I love that. I think it's nice and... And, and practical and for me what I'm also hearing you say is just take that first step but take the step in the context of the problem that you're trying to solve um, I think the data driven element is really important and I think it opens up a lot of new doors and, and opportunities Man, a couple of key takeaways for me that I think really stood out in our conversation and thank you for sharing your, your insights and, and wisdom with us today I think the first one is you have to define what talent management means for you in your organization. And when we refer to the term, what does that entail and where does that sit and what is its objective? That objective has to be aligned to the business strategy. So talent is about solving a business problem. It's not about solving anything else. And I think that's a really important thing for um, us as HR professionals to bear in mind. Love the fact that you spoke about we need to simplify talent management and not necessarily each fight our own little battle of careers sit here, this thing sits there. Simplify and speak to it from what the business outcome is that we are trying to trying to connect. Love it that we spoke about the fact that there's some modern talent approaches on the horizon, things like relationship management, talent marketplaces, talent exchange programs. And I think just a very different way that organizations are starting to think about how do we solve the talent challenge, because I think it is a challenge, it's not a war, but I think it is a challenge for them that they need to be able to solve. Love it that we are also able to deep dive into the utilization of some traditional talent tools such as the nine box grid. I really like the shift in the movement towards skills based mapping. I know it's a topic you and I've written about in the past as well. And starting to think more about what is the skill I need at a particular point in time and that talent management and skills management is a is a live process that is continuously evolving as part of that. And the last point I want to highlight really is the, the data component, that you have to drive a data evidence-based practice, which then allows you to drive a more solid process around the decisions that you want to make in the process, a lot more fair, a lot more unbiased. And I do think it allows you to really mature the practice over time, not necessarily to align to a maturity model, but to align to the needs of the business at that particular point. Marna, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Where can they engage with you? And where can they find out more about the work that you do and the research you do in the talent space? Yeah, so I think I use LinkedIn. Um, so people are welcome to follow me. I share some of my own ideas, some ideas that I find interesting that other people share. And then obviously some of our AHR research as well. So I am on LinkedIn. So people can follow me if they want to 
Manuel, from my side, thank you very, very much. I uh, really appreciate your insights um, and look forward to catching up with you soon.